There's this idea that most sex happens at night and it's all supposed to and supposed to get, you know, all groovy and sexy and, and nighttime. But generally speaking, the best times to have sex for your arousal response and the drive is going to be right after you wake up and then probably around midday. So you just have to do it in whatever way works for you with the schedule that you have. Also just mentioned, mentioned that as of now, I have two dog children that do not n nearly require the same amount of consideration that the human children do. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna speak to this from what I've gathered information from clients that have kids. I have not traversed that territory yet. At Active Life, we believe that the healthcare clinic of the future is the gym. Everybody starts with the best case scenario in mind. Never sell anything to anybody who is not in the market for what you have. The only reason we work out is to create the opportunity to recover. And the healthcare provider of the future is the coach. And this is why you guys need to get paid well, because what you're doing is really, really hard work. Lex Martinez, welcome to the Active Life Podcast. I'm so excited for this conversation. I am too. I, you know, for people who are listening, when I first got introduced to you, Lex by Michael Cashew, uh, he, he just thought it would be a great idea for me to interview you on the show. And my initial thought was, that'd be really cool. But what do I ask a sex coach, a sex and love coach on the Active Life podcast that is even remotely relevant to the people who listen to it? Uh, and then I had you on the, the pre-show interview where we kind of talked about what would be good and what wouldn't be good. And I was like, oh man, I want to hire this person. <laughs> and so we hired you as our coach, Kim and I. So full circle, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. So you've been really putting in work, preparing for this episode. Putting in work. Yes. L yes. All kinds of work preparing for this episode. Uh, I think that what would be really valuable right off the jump street would be to kind of talk about what is the scope that you see for a sex and love coach? Because when I tell people I hired a sex coach, I get one of two reactions. I get, Ooh, what's that like? Mm -hmm. Or I get, what do you need a sex coach for dude? Like, you don't know what you're doing? <laughs> I'm like, it's, it's, you're missing the point. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I do. I feel like I know a, a medium sized amount about a lot of different things that are under the general umbrella of sex, love, relationships, intimacy, dating. So people find their way to me when they have, and they'll present all kinds of different challenges. And it might not even be a challenge, it might just be like a, hey, I, I think there's something more going on here that I'm just not clued in on. So sometimes people come to me and it's, you know, the six months to a year post baby, and they're just having a hard time reconnecting. It's people who are sleep deprived, disconnected from their body, all of these different things. And it's like, how do we just get back connected? You know, and, and I have major kudos for people who, who seek a third party to help them with that. You know, that's so much pressure to put on the relationship when, you know, let's say you're six months to a year post baby. And it's like, I already got so many other things floating around in my brain. Like the idea of getting sexual with you is just like, I cannot, I just need 17 extra hours of sleep, 12 cups of coffee. Like it's just hard. I have people come to me that, you know, they are, they're loving their relationship and they want it to be even better. Just like they go to the gym or they hire, uh, you know, a a coach in the gym or they hire somebody to help them with their nutrition or their business or their mindset or something to get better. What's the, what's the thing that I can't see where I'm at right now. So um, I'll have people who are in really awesome relationships and they want to do some work and gain some skills so that they can ensure that it continues to grow and flourish. And then I have people that are just like in really tough spots. They have a, a challenging time coming to terms with the type of sexual expression they really want to have. They have a hard time with really going for the kind of relationship that they want. And I have people come to me that are like, I just feel broken. Can you please help me fix this shit? Like I just, it, it's all, it's sideways all the time. I don't know what I'm doing. So it's, 
all over the map. It could be women coming to me, they're having pain, experiencing pain during intercourse. Women come to me, they're having challenges with orgasming, or they'll say, I can orgasm on my own, but I have trouble with doing that with a partner, or I've never done that with a partner. I'm talking about women who have births, you know, more than one child. And they're like, I've never orgasmed with my husband, you know, and I have men that come to me that are like, I just don't know what the fuck to do. Can I say the F word here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So I don't, you know, men come to me and they're like, I don't know what the fuck to do. Can you like help me? She's complicated. I don't know the buttons and the levers and the knobs. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of all over the place. And generally speaking, I help people figure out what the more is. I help them get connected back to their bodies, get them connected to their desires and what they actually want to experience in their intimacy and in their sex life um, and help them achieve those things. You know, I think that one of the most resonant things that you said to Kimberly and I, Kimberly and me, and me, on our first call was that one of your jobs is to help us avoid the, the, the subconscious resentment that could build up in a relationship when you feel like you're limited in what you can experience sexually because you've chosen a single partner who you want to love, who you want to support, who you want to feel all of the love from you. So you repress the things that you think they might not be willing to do or want to do so that you can make them happy, which ultimately limits your life experience. And for both of us, that was a very um, grounding statement. It was like, wow, are we actually, are we doing that to ourselves without realizing? And without a doubt, the answer was yes. You know, we, we've, we've had conversations since starting to work with you that have transformed the way that that we have sex, that we talk about sex, that we think about sex, all of those things. So, uh, yeah, thank you for that. There was no doubt in my mind that you knew how to do the thing. You have three kids. Yeah, yeah, we weren't. No doubt in my mind, right? And most people, it's like, you don't know how to do sex. It's pretty easy. Insert part B and do slot A, add some frictions, you know, friction and more or less success. Like, you know how to do the sex, but do you know how to do it in a way that is like, you know, the most blissful connective experience that you've ever had. And it's varied and it's not monotonous and it's not boring and it's not a leads to B leads to C every time for however many years of your life until you die. Well, you know, well, most you, people know how to do sex. Well, that, well, that's the thing. And there's, I think that when people think about a sex coach, I think they envision just from what I've been told when I ask him, they envision like, oh, so I have sex with Kim. You On watch camera. and you tell me like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Do it like that. Grab this. Put your fingers there. It's, uh, I don't know if that's like level 10 and we're at level one, but we haven't even gone near that. That's month. That's month three. Oh, okay, perfect. Great. Yeah, yeah. So it's coming up. Awesome. Um, <laughs> but I think that I would like to explore with you more of the, communication around initiating sex because that is the for me before we started working with you our relationship was very good I felt like Kim and I were in probably the best place that we've ever been and we've taken that to another level since starting to work with you and one of the awkward moments that I constantly had to have before you created opportunities for us that were different was uh, so like you want to have sex tonight? It sucks. It sucks. That is the worst question to ask. Hey babe, want to, want to have sex? Uh, not tonight. I'm tired. Oh, okay, cool. Can we watch a show that I like then? Like what the fuck? It sucked. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. How has it how how has it changed for you since then? Better I ask you, and then I, I can so, maybe yeah. expand on it. How well, is it different? You, you gave us the uh, like our, our own our, our freedom to create a code, if you will, and and the code is now. If first of all, we can talk about things all day long that lead us to more likely wanting to have sex at night, mm-hmm. and um, sex isn't always sex. It's not always blowjobs and you know it's not the things that sex always we always thought of like sometimes sex is just being sexual with each other and we can get to 
when and how, and like that's been mind altering as well. But instead of saying, Hey, do you want to have sex tonight? Like we've been having conversations throughout the day oftentimes now that lead us to believing, okay, well our sex time is usually night and it leads us to believe, okay, we're, we're more likely to have sex today than otherwise. And we have a candle in the bedroom. So if one of us goes into the room first, light the candle. It doesn't mean sex is on. It just means I'd be interested in sex tonight if you would. It's like a soft invitation. Yeah, yeah. It's the start of a potential container creation. Exactly. Then the second person who walks into the bedroom sees the candle and either locks the door or blows out the candle. And if the door gets locked, it's like immediate, like, oh, yeah, this is happening, you know? And if yeah. they don't lock the door, it's, okay, no big deal. You know, we don't, we don't there's nothing, nothing ventured, nothing lost here, no awkward conversation, no ask. It was really, really, really simple. Then, if the door is locked, we never before have done this, but we'll have a conversation. What do we, what do we want out of this? Instead of just like, you on top, me on top, like, you know, naked, shirts on, what do you want to do? It's, no, 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 no. We have a conversation now. Like, what, what would we like this to be? And that affects the music that we play. It affects the amount of light that's in the room. It affects everything. And we'd never thought to do that before. I'm so proud. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. This is like A plus star student. That's it. I, I need my gold stars. Yeah, but yeah. So, but so how how does that become something that uh, is even less awkward, if you will? Because there's still that, uh, like, it, it's, it's, if we were at 100 for, like, hey, want to have sex tonight? That sucked. Now we're at, like, I would say 10% of the friction that that caused. Yeah. But there's still a level of, like, I could be uh, turned bummer. down. Yeah. Yeah. I could be turned down. I could be rejected. Mm-hmm. You know, whatever, whatever the thing is, you know, the other person has no idea what's going on inside of your brain. Right. And you could be thinking of all these really delicious, lovely things. You could have been thinking about her all day and then you just can't wait to light the candle and you light the candle and she comes in she's like, a kid just did the most incredible thing and I cannot. Right. And blows up the candle. And it's like, dang, mm-hmm. you know? So I, I get it. So the, I can speak to the candle and where that all kind of came from and the reason why it helps to transition people, if you'd like. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's, I usually call it a toggle. So when people are having a, a kind of a challenging time with the initiation, um, and I'll speak for myself, like Jordan and I, I am a sex coach. I'm speaking to people about sex all day. Every day I have multiple shelves in my office that are filled with all kinds of trinkets and gadgets, colorful things. I have floggers, I have ticklers, I have pinwheels, I have literally any, you want for nothing in my house because companies send me things. I have more lube than you can probably fill a bathtub with. (laughs) So it's just like, we want for nothing here. And so with this, like wanting for nothing, there's this kind of pressure that it's always available. And I'm not always available for that. And so he is not a sex coach. He's a conscious bro. He is very like his variety in sex um, from college into adulthood has been variety in women. He's a pretty boy. He's got a lot of charisma. So his, his, when boredom would set in or tension would set in, it was kind of like, oh, let's just move on to the next relationship. And so his variety was in different types of people. So different types of experiences in that way. And I got to a point where I was done with trying the new ones on and I wanted depth and experience. And so when we first got together, I remember saying to him, like, you're really pretty, but you're going to have to be more than that. And if you want to be in this with me, just so you know, I'm very challenged by the concept of monogamy. And that is something that I am continuing to dig into and figure out where I stand in it. I know where I stand now, but this was over three years ago. And um, I said, and the second one is I treat, because he's like big on personal development and consciousness and all this stuff. And like your sexual development is just as important as your spiritual and personal development. 
And dare I say, they're all intertwined and interwoven with each other. And you can only get so far in one of the buckets unless you look at how you feel about sex. I have to look there. And so he was like, yeah, I'm game. What does this mean? I get to have threesomes? Yeah. Like, <laughs> it was just very bro and lovely and kind of like, I'll do whatever you want, like puppy. And, and he is so awesome with this whole thing because I am like kind of dark and moody and I like dominance and submission. And I like all these kind of kinky concepts um, because they played a role in my life that at first I had no idea what... I like that I would be into some of that stuff. And then it was delivered to me. And then I went, Oh shit, I can never turn back now. I'm like, it's I'm tainted forever. And so bringing these kind of things up to him is just so far out there. And so if you can imagine him interacting with me, he feels like I know so much more Mm -hmm. than he does. And it's intimidating. And he's never been in a position. I mean, he considers it to be like, I don't really like to use the word intimidating, but he has a little bit of resistance. Like, am I going to do this thing wrong? Intimidating. Yeah. So he's like, you know, and he's read some of my previous stories, my previous writings where I've talked about BDSM experience and I've talked about these like really orgasmic, you know, all this stuff. And he's seen me on stage and he's seen me with people working with them. And if I start talking about something that he knows nothing about, you can imagine what that feels like in him as he then approaches me the next day to have sex. He's like, am I going to do this right? Am I going to say this thing right? All of that. And so then that puts me in this position where, you know, this whole masculine and feminine dynamic, it's like, I don't want to be the teacher Mm -hmm. and I don't want to have to lay the things out. And also whatever you bring to me is really great. And also I can't put the desire in you to want to gain more information. And I can't be the access point necessarily. You've got to want to do that on your own. It has to matter to you just as much as it matters to me for us to move forward with this. So we kept having these kind of like tension moments. I'm also, you know, I run a business. I'm busy in my office, even though I've tried to soften it the fuck up with like pinks and things. I still am like making decisions and on calls and holding containers and doing all these things. When I come out of the office, my testosterone is like through the roof. It's hard. I mean, yes, that is a sex driver, but it's also, I'm feeling very powerful. I'm very, feeling very purposeful, but my dick is out. And so it's hard, right? Mm-hmm. He's straight. We don't, we're not, this is not the, the best environment. So I need this long story to, to like put it into context. I, and I think a lot of people, not just women, just people in general, in a couple, one typically has the, the higher libido or is the one that is wanting more than maybe the other, or there's just kind of an awkwardness in the transition. Like, are we going to do this? And so, you know, there's a playlist that could be on that I will recognize. And it is a signal to my nervous system to relax. It is a signal that I get to consciously choose to tell myself sex is about to happen. Don't fight it. You love sex. You love pleasure. And, and that's my, me telling myself, and you love the connection that you have with Jordan. who's my partner with Jordan on the other side. And we have this mantra that is anything is available to us on the other side of sex. And so sex now, not, not only is it like, oh, this is our means to communicate and to feel good and all of that, but sex has now gotten to be lots of different things. And it, it, it fills lots of different buckets. And I think you're getting to experience that too, Sean, but um, just to bring you back on the toggle, it could be a playlist. It could be a special blanket. It could be a candle. It's something to signal. This is an offer. This is available. And I like how you and Kimberly are using it because it's like, this is me asking, saying I'm available and you get to decide, you know, are you in? And so I imagine for her seeing that candle, it might be like kind of a, like a a shake to the nervous system, to the brain to go, oh, Mm -hmm. he's into that right now. Am I into that right now? And then like weigh all the options. Am I really into this right now? Like, do I want to fight to stay in like stress or tiredness or busyness? Or do I want to make a conscious choice? to step into intimacy, to relax my nervous system, to like give myself what is the antidote for the, all the other stuff basically. And so I love that. That's what y'all have chosen it. Um, to that's what it's, uh, unfolded for you. Is that, that is there there a way though, to make it so that, you know, for example, one of the things I like about the candle that I would, I I've been thinking about how to make 
more resonant or more more potent is if Kim could smell the candle before she came into the bedroom Mm -hmm. so that when she comes into the bedroom, she's already been thinking like, I'm going to see a candle when I go in or vice versa. So that there isn't that like, oh, candles on, um, 7,000 thoughts, lock the door or blow it out. And then you're like, fuck, I don't know if that's the decision I wanted to make. How is there a way to make that even like a, like a, almost like a more gradual incline to the candle? Yeah. I mean, it depends. I, I love the getting the senses activated. So you could either light the candle and leave the door open if it does have a scent or you could have a room spray, which I've instructed, you know, I've, I've given that to people before too, where you can either burn, let's say Palo Santo, or you can burn, um, something that gives a smell like sweet grass or something like that. Sage is a little bit too strong, um, for me personally. And I don't, it's not a really like sexy smell. Mm-hmm. Uh, so something like that, cause it will, it will waft, but I know people that have chosen a particular kind of room spray and like, maybe you go and spray it into the hall okay. or like right outside, something like that. Um, it could be that she hears the sound of the music and mm-hmm. there's like a handful of songs. And so that's kind of like wafting in the background. There's, there's no yeah. hearing the music outside of the bedroom. Cause our, our upstairs sounds like an airplane hangar with oh. all those noise machines so that the kids don't hear us moving around in the house. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of that, I really love that, that you said that like a, a noise machine. Do y'all do the lock the door with a noise machine on the, like right outside the door? Of, out of our kids' rooms? Oh, well this was, this was to be your room. Oh, do y'all have, have machines in the kids' rooms? We have every kid's room has a noise machine and there are two mm-hmm. noise machines in the hallway and there's a lock on our door. I mean, it is literally like you are, there's an airplane pulling out of the, out of the hangar and you, you can't hear anything except, <laughs> except the noise machines. Yeah. And is that for them because they like the noise machines or is that for, to mask the sounds oh, of it's sex? To mask, no, it's to mask the sounds of anything. 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 Like, um, I mean, we, if we have all those noise machines on and our door cracks when we open it, our three-year-old who shares a wall with us is like, they're up, they're awake. And one of the hardest things for us to overcome, maybe you can speak to this also, is the, our oldest daughter is going to be six in February. Um, outside of when she was an infant and she would nap in a different room, we have not had sex while the kids were home in six years until last month, right? And I mean, like, it's now it's just like, go downstairs, I don't care what you do. Mommy and daddy are not in the room with you right now. We have something else to do. We're going to do some cleaning. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, don't, you don't like cleaning. So we're going to go clean upstairs. We're going to go eat spicy food and clean. The two things that you hate. Uh, but, you know, there's still that level. Of, and we're getting better. But there's still that level of, um, you know, last week, our three-year-old, like, knocked on the door. I want you. Too bad. Too bad. I guess what I'm getting at is h- how do you create presence in that moment when there's so much else that could happen that would be like, oh, like we're, there are 7,000 worst case scenarios that could happen in the mm-hmm. moment from like the other day I walked downstairs and our six year old is changing our two year old's shit diaper, which by the way, not in her skill set. You know, (laughs) so (laughs) it's difficult to keep present. How do you, how do you do that when you're a parent, you have kids and you don't want to reserve sex for only like at bedtime? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just note that bedtime is usually when people are the most tired. It's bedtime. Mm -hmm. The parents, the hormone cycle in a day, your testosterone's at its lowest right before you're going to go to bed. And that's your drive. So it's difficult. There's this idea that most sex happens at night and it's all supposed to, and supposed to get, you know, all groovy and sexy and and nighttime. But generally speaking, the best times to have sex for your arousal response and the drive is going to be right after you wake up and then probably around midday. So you just have to do it in whatever way works for you with the schedule that you have also just mentioned 
mention that as of now, I have two dog children that do not n- nearly require the same amount of consideration that the human children do. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to speak to this from what I've gathered information from clients that have kids. I have not traversed that territory yet, but I have had awkward dog stares and Biggie is our pit bull has jumped on the bed and then peed in the area where we were having sex to mark the territory. So it's gone weird in its own ways. I've got a little, a little tight taste of the experience. Mm -hmm. My dogs are definitely preparation, I think. So if anything can prepare. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a matter of saying it too. It's not like a, but what if, but what if, but what if it's like, Hey, I'm coming for you. We're doing this thing there's a high probability that this, 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 or something different is going to happen. And until the thing happens, be with me here. Don't let's not solve a problem that we don't have right now. Cause right now we're connecting and it might be for five minutes. It might be for 15 minutes. We might not even actually get anything penetrated or anywhere, but we're going to do this because it's important and just showing your partner that this is important and and not leaving it up to chance, spontaneity, or nighttime. Mm-hmm. So I think even if you do a quick, like, little sesh, and then somebody knocks on the door, and you don't really get to finish, well, if you're the gentleman, let's just say as a heterosexual couple, and, and you know, gentle, go to the kid, tell your wife to finish herself. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you about it later. Yeah. You know, you get to make it how you want to. So it's not, it's not like, oh, all the sexy is done. It's like, hey, I'm going to go take care of this. You be with yourself, finish. Like we can take care of me later. Well, and and you're speaking about finish. And one of the things that we've also talked about with you is that the goal is not always orgasm, orgasm. Right. You know, so, so that, that radically changed the way that we thought about what sex is what else is sex if not i orgasm you orgasm high five what do you want to watch or are we just going to sleep yeah like seriously like what i what else is it i would love for you to say it better than i could say it sure so i think for a lot of people sex is one kind of thing more or less Like it represents over time, especially in a long-term relationship, it just gets to be this thing that kind of feels like it's on the to-do list. It always feels good once you get going and you're always happy that you did it on the other side. And then you feel good for about a day. And then the little kind of thing in the back of the mind starts creeping like, when, but when, how long is it going to be that till the next time? And is it going to be kind of awkward or, you know, it, it winds up feeling kind of more or less playing that out that way, um, in a very predictable way kind of way. Um, but whenever you really sit with it, like what, what else can sex be? If you just ask yourself that, you know, if you're listening to this podcast and you press pause and you sit with that question for a moment, what else can sex be to me? Sex is stress relief. Sex is intimacy. Sex is deeply connective for the individual and for the the couple. Sure. Sex can be a way for you to express yourself So if you're feeling like life is just kind of dull, this can be an opportunity and a way for you to show more of the colors of who you are. If that's what you want to, you know, if you want to do that, it's very vulnerable. It's also a way to build um, connection through vulnerability. Uh, So for me personally, I always like to speak from my personal perspective because it's a little bit easier And then, of course, clients too. But for me, sex is great when it's a quickie and it's spontaneous. I don't put all my eggs in that basket because I know how this goes. I've been in multiple long-term relationships and I know that that is not fair to either party. And uh, the average penis yielder has 11 erections a day. So, you know, they all don't mean stay it somewhere. True. But there's sexual energy or arousal energy happening up to 11 hours you know, times a day. So you're in a car and it's kind of bumpy and all of a sudden hard dick. Mm -hmm. You're like, all of a sudden you see this thing through a window and it looks a little sexy and it's like the tree and, oh, you know, like it could be literally anything. (laughs) I don't have a penis, but I've 
talk to enough owners of them to know that it's pretty easy. <laughs> usually You're 100% right. there's a gap between thoughts. Oh, boner. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like where, what the fuck do I do with this now? Yes. God damn it. Okay. So, um, you know, that's one that's spontaneous kind of, uh, arousal, so to speak other buckets for sex, sex for Jordan and I, um, there's kind of, we do something called a relationship board meeting where we like to get on the same page at the start of every week. What does your schedule look like? Where are your windows for opportunity for connection? Doesn't necessarily mean sex, but connection, because when we stay connected and we're communicating and we do the work in order to stay in that good communication, good connection, intimacy, then our lives, generally speaking, just are better. Our lives are better. And so we'll say, okay, well, where's an opportunity potentially to explore, meaning try something new. Because if I don't create, if we don't create an environment where we can try something new, where we're not required to make it sexy and it's not required to bring orgasms all around, it's like, how else does he learn the majority of the tools that I have? So I create an experience or create a container with him where we might bring a couple of things, concepts, toys, something, and we do exactly what you do with a toy. You play with it, play with it, play with your body. How does that feel? Get the feedback. And so we call those sex explorations and it's literally, he'll like put it on my calendar. Sex exploration is going to be here. And like I said, it might not even involve the actual act of penis and vagina intercourse, but it's going to be something. We're going to do something new. Um, maybe we're going to do the, the spanking exercise, you know, which I, taught Sean and Kimberly how to do that. I don't surprisingly, by the way, yeah. way less weird yeah. than I was like, I was like, I don't want to get spanked. And then she started doing what you taught her to do. I was like, oh, I think I might like that. It was, yeah. <laughs> it, was it was just, it was interesting. It's yeah. You, you mentioned one time when we were talking, you brought something up and I was like, I would rather put my dick in a light switch than do that. And you uh, handled it well. And you were like, cool, got it, not for you. I want to help you get to a place where you can sit for a second, think about it, and say, eh, not for me. Where it doesn't send you to the moon in terms of repelling you from the thought, because the thought, if, if that happens so organically, it creates the, the, the missed opportunity to maybe welcome some things that would be exciting and enjoyable. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I love that. It sounds like y'all got to experience that in reverse after I was not on the call with you. Yeah. So, so yeah. for, for some context for you guys to know what we're talking Great. about, uh, Lex asked Kim and me yesterday, yesterday to yeah. experiment with what it felt like to spank and get spanked in three different ways, fingertips, uh, cupping and full hand. And it was, the idea was just like work your way from what does a one feel like all the way up to like, what does a seven, eight feel like? And it, it definitely felt weird to do. Yeah. I'm not, you know, no, no bullshitting that. It was like, all right, I'm going to lay across my lap. I'm going to spank you. Uh, that was weird because we've never thought that was a thing that we wanted to do. We're still not sure if we want to do it in an actual sexual encounter, but it was the cool thing for me was to say, to take something off the list that was like never not interested, totally weird and make it approachable and, and have that be a placeholder for all the other things that I think are weird, not interesting and say, well, maybe, maybe we try 50 and one of them is like a real turn on. That's, that's life changing. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. worth it. I love hearing you speak about this now too. And I remember when you said that, I'm like, I'd rather put my dick in a light switch or something. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, well, <laughs> the goal is not going to be to do that thing. Right. The goal is going to be for you to be able to sit with that thing, think about that thing, and maybe even consider it. Like yeah. take yourself in there in your mind. Just imagine like the, the possibilities, the excitement in the possibilities that are available. Like you, when else do adults get to really truly play? No, it's true. It's true. I, and, and, and it's just as arousing intellectually to try something that feels totally taboo, totally weird and to do it without the pressure of this being a great sexual experience. Yes. That's, that's when you talk about sex exploration, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's, that's the thing for me that has been so liberating is it's like, 
we can try this and not have it be great sex, but we trying it to see if we would like to incorporate it into what we think great sex would be. And, and it's like any, anyone who played sports growing up, you don't play the game every day. So there's got to be some practice in there. And the practice is like, I'm going to try this move. That didn't work seven times in a row. Maybe it's the wrong move or maybe I'm not good enough at it. So that was liberating. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, other than, than this exploration, something else that we started talking about, which is a little more out there of a concept, kind of woo. They all know I'm out there. They don't know you're out there? No, they all know I'm out there. Oh, Everybody they all knows. know you're out there. Okay. So, I mean, anybody who could get down with meditation, you know, I think that what I'm about to say, they could, they could really vibe with, mm-hmm. you know, because I've had some pretty incredible experiences through meditation and breath work. And you know, to, to feel your body in that way, it feels powerful to feel, you know, to envision while you're meditating, the light coming in through your crown to envision the different colors and your chakras or your energy points. Like it feels, it just feels, I would say different types of meditation feel different ways, but you to bring that idea into sex as well can be a form of sex and spirituality. It's kind of the convergence or the intersection of this act that we as humans definitely do for fun and pleasure way more than we do to make children, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's a way for us to take some of that mindfulness and that spirituality and the universe and the cosmos and all that and kind of intersect it with, okay, this is really potent, powerful um, energies at play that can create children or can create other humans, but what would we like to create with it instead. And that's a, a question that you can ask. And so I've been, I've been delivering a little tidbit here and a little tidbit there, because I can get really out there describing sex magic uh, and Tantra. And, and those are not exclusive necessarily, but there are a lot of Tantric practices that you can create a sex magic ritual with. So this would be another bucket. So Jordan and I have, it's kind of like yoga is a practice and hitting the mat is a practice. And I don't always want to walk up to the mat or like roll it out and I lay on it. I'm like, can we just get to Shavasana already? Like, Mm -hmm. I just want to be done. It's kind of the same feels as like doing the sex and sex magic is definitely a practice. And so we extrapolated on that ritual, which I'm going to start having more conversations with you and Kimberly about. So yes, you light the candle, put the room spray. There's that general idea. But what if you know at this time, this is what we're going to do. It's not an offering. We are doing it at this time. And let's say, Um, you bring in journaling and you write about your desires. What do you want? What do you want in life? Just write it out for five minutes, read it to each other. And this is what I want for you, for me, for us in life This is what I want. And it doesn't necessarily need to be like a year to five years down the line. It could be something that could be that day. I want my day to go like this. I want my week to be like this and talk about it, say it out loud. And then Add elements of the ritual like breath work, eye gazing. So eye gazing would be if you sit cross-legged part your part across from your partner. And I had Sean and Kim do this, one of our first sessions. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's never eye gazed, it seems so simple. You stare into the eyes of the other person. It is super vulnerable and very challenging. And people get like, they go oftentimes go from laughter to sadness, to love. It's like the whole range of emotion. And we've, just, done, we've done it multiple times on our own, not in a meeting with you since, because it, it does have that profound effect. It does. It's like a way for the vibe, the frequency, everything to just sync up your hearts, your breath, everything starts beating and breathing in and out at the same time. It's just like, an, it's a hack. Really, it's a hack. Just do the thing, stare at each other for a minute, get really vulnerable, let the other person see into you. So maybe you stare into each other's eyes for two minutes and then maybe you consciously take deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth or in and out of your nose while looking at each other, or you can even have your eyes closed. And then from there you start to invite touch. And as you invite touch, maybe you continue talking about the thing that you said that you want to create. And then eventually that might lead to sex. And as you build up to orgasm, you bring into the space, you continue talking about what it is that you want to create in life together. So you're so saying it, talk about it like 
like have a legitimate conversation about the future that you want to build while you're having sex with your partner as you get closer and closer to orgasm. Yes. It's funny. It's funny is the wrong word. That sounds so not sexy. I know. But I've been really turned on by some of the things that I've achieved mm -hmm. in life. And there have been these times where I look around and the thing, whatever the thing was, is happening. And I look at Jordan, Jordan looks at me, and it's like, it's like, I'm going to fuck you eyes. It's not a sexual thing that's happening, but it's like, you are powerful and that's hot and I fucking love you. And I'm going to show you right now with my dick. <laughs> like, <laughs> I like it. It's kind, of, it's kind of like that. Now, it might be weird. Like talking during sex is really strange for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, I'm from deep South Louisiana. I grew up Catholic. My understanding was all sex before marriage wrong, of course. And that pleasuring myself, masturbation, wrong, go to hell, all of that. And so a lot of people learn to be very secretive mm -hmm. and learn to keep it very quiet. And so a lot of, um, a lot of women, I should say, because we are the ones that are more vocal when pleasure is happening versus it's not typical. It's not common that men make a lot of sounds and a lot of vocals. It's more female copulatory auditory something I can't remember what the exact phrasing is but we make sounds primate female primates make sounds and um so taught to stifle it make it quick be done really fast and almost stop breathing you know on the verge of orgasm or on the verge of the climax to just like stifle the whole expression keep it really soft and quiet and so just to actually bring in sound during sex for me is real it has been really challenging because my whole understanding was, you know, in the bathtub, in the shower, when I was like a preteen and a teenager. And then also like, if I were in my bed, then I just needed to pretend like I was sleeping. Mm -hmm. You know, like I needed to pretend that I wasn't doing the thing that I was doing and, and I needed to keep it quiet. So, you know, to have a partner, to be learning these concept that, concepts that say, bring in breath, bring in sound, bring in movement. Like my whole life, I've just known to be very still and make it look like it's not happening. You know, don't sound off an alarm, so to speak. Don't, don't, if I make it super quiet, then maybe God won't know I did it. <laughs> you know, some shit I don't like know that. if that's how it works. I don't know if that's how it works. It's not, <laughs> it's, it's not, but yeah, to think about like talking during sex is like, ugh, I, it, it's hard. And so maybe not having a full blown conversation, but I would say if it's not full blown conversation, station, it's repeating what you heard mm -hmm. when you were doing the initial journaling. It, it can be easier, can build off from there. Repeating the other person's. Yeah. Or okay. repeating your own. So I, I have two more questions that I, well, I want to make sure I get to with you. Yeah. Um, the first one is if you don't mind, one of the things that you talked to Kim and me about was when you and your partner were kind of in friction if you will, in your relationship. And you saw him at a party. You knew you were going to see him at the party. You went together and you took him off because you needed to break that tension. That's something that, uh, it was a really cool story to hear. And I would love to, if you would share that story, that would be great. Mm -hmm. And then I would love to ask you a question about that story. And then I have a, one more thing I want to make sure we talk sure. about. Yeah, absolutely. So this, again, we're going right along in the different buckets. Sex can be tension relief. You know, it doesn't always have to be this magical, beautiful, sexy experience. Sometimes my, my, in my partnership, our relationship needs to fuck. Like our relationship is just like both of us are bumping heads. Maybe I'm at a particular time in my cycle and so I'm just very irritable, easily irritated, frustrated. There's no way that he could win. Like I'm aware of it and he's aware of it. There's no way. We actually went to um, a party for friends, mutual friends of ours that, that y'all know. And we got there and I was late and I was rushed and I was feeling all this pressure. And then he arrived and I was just like, was basically wanting to crawl out of my own skin. And we had had a challenging couple of days, more or less attention had been building. He got there and there, there got to a point where I was like, just kind of pulled him into <clears throat> one of the side rooms, locked the door and said, I'm going to suck your dick. 
And he was like, okay. And I was like, (laughs) because I need it. I need to chill the fuck out. I need to surrender. I need to submit because I'm just too uptight. And I know that that's going to do it. And now on a biological scientific level, sucking dick or having um, even your anus, right? Played with, that's the the tail end. They have um, the tail end of your vagal nerve. You can engage your vagal nerve, which if you engage your vagal nerve, you will relax. So uh, of course, if you don't like severely clench your, your butt, then you will eventually relax. If there's a lot of like softness put into that area, there's a lot of nerve endings right there. And so I knew that if I engage the back of my throat, that I would calm the fuck down. And so I got on my knees and I'm like, this is definitely in devotion to you. You are my person. I need to calm down. So our relationship needs to fuck. And he still talks about that experience. He says that it is the best, we call it cock worship. It's like, that is the best blow job, the best cock worship he's ever had in his whole life. And he was kind of one of those, like, I never finish, you know, I never ejaculate through having a, um, oral sex done. And he did at that time, he like could not help it. And he's like, that's never happened to me before. And I'm like, oh, I feel better. <laughs> and then we were connected. Then we, then we could just chill. So, you know, the two quick follow up questions that the first one is I'm picturing women listening to this right now and being like, why do we have to be the one who, who does it? Like, why, 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 like, why do I have to give my guy a blow job just because we're having a fight? And I, I want to, just take two seconds if you wouldn't just clear the it's not because okay. you're a woman thing. No, that really didn't have anything to do with him. Right. I did that thing because it feels good to me. Okay. I did that thing because I, I mean, this is from my experience, of course, because I love him. Even when I'm pissed, I love him. And it wasn't for him, which I was very clear about. I'm like, I'm about to do this just so you know, it is not for you. Mm-hmm. And I went in and I'm like, I just need to calm down. And I think about like, if he would have come to me and been like, we're, it's tension. Let me eat you out. I'd have been like, fuck you. (laughs) Go away. You know? So it was definitely something that I needed to come to terms with in myself. And that's me. So you think about your relationship and your dynamic. If your partner's saying like, go lay down, I'm about to eat you out. You're going to breathe. You're going to relax. You're going to receive like that's hot too. It just happened to be in that situation. That was not available. So, so so the next question to that one is there was tension for a reason. Do you then, is it then easier to move to the conversations around what was driving the tension? Is that part of the value there? I'm sorry is really easy to achieve on the other side of it. Cause it's like, fuck, Ugh, I don't, I just want to be done with it. Let's mm-hmm. be done with it. Okay. I love you. I love you. Great. Right. Yeah. But it doesn't, it doesn't end up being something that's just like, Oh, we can sweep crap onto the rug as long as we no. keep having. Okay. That's what I want No, to. absolutely. Absolutely not. But I'm softer. I'm much easier to manage. And I know this in myself, I'm a type a kind of millennial woman. And I know, you know, I'm aware in the moments where I'm like, I know that I'm not being super soft. I know that I'm not being very receptive. And I know that I'm not speaking with very much grace. I have self-awareness and I'm trapped. I'm trapped in it. So I'm going to use sex or I'm going to use some kind of element of intimacy building because he could come over me over to me and be like, just take some breaths and rub my shoulder. It was not going to be as effective. Mm-hmm. So like, I just want to be real with myself. What's actually going to work? And this is not a tit for tat kind of thing, or I do this and then you do that. There's no like reciprocal kind of energy for my partner and I, anyway, it's like, if this is all about you, then it's all about you. I don't need to get you off so that then you return the favor. It's not a favor. This is about us being in connection and feeling good or breaking the tension. You know what? I think one of the most um, wild things about this conversation for me is I don't think I realized how much you've taught Kim and me until I just recognized that we don't have a three hour podcast blocked and there are seven more things that I could ask you about Mm -hmm. and we could talk about that have made massive influence in the way that we approach sex with each other. So that's just an aside. That's very cool. 
Thank Great. you for that. Uh, the, the one that stood out the most was how we do things in terms of what kind of foods we're eating, what kind of foods I'm preparing for Kim around her cycle, how we're having sexual decision-making around her cycle instead of just like sex is this. So it doesn't matter where you are. Like that's what sex is. That That's aside. We can put that in this little, little container as you would like to say. Uh, the thing I want to really get to next is scheduling. You mm-hmm. talk about the relationship boardroom or the relationship board, board meeting. Room. Yeah. Board meeting. Um, when we first started talking about scheduling sex for Kim, especially, uh, it was very like, bah, your sex life. That's where your sex life goes to die is on a schedule. That's, that's kind of how she felt about it. And I understood why she felt that way. I remember the first time I heard one of my friends saying that they did it a while back and I was like, that's that's so lame. Uh, now that is not lame. And one of the ways that we've been able to to look at that is if you were going to cheat on me, part of it would be for the excitement of like not getting caught and being with somebody new and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'd rather you not do that. I'd rather you just tell me, but you know, either way. But you'd have to schedule it because you couldn't be like, Hey, oh, funny seeing you here at the supermarket. Want to go fuck in the car? <laughs> right? And so so the scheduling in that situation is exciting. Why is it not allowed to be exciting in our personal relationship? And, and that's kind of how we've started to look at it. So can you unpack a little bit about scheduling sex and how it's not lame and it's not the only sex that you're allowed to have? Yeah, absolutely. I love that. I've never thought of it that way. So that's really great. Um, And I think like when people first start dating too, and they live in different locations, it's like, oh, I'll be over at six. Mm -hmm. Well, if your relationship is new, then chances are there's going to be some kind of sexual thing that happens. And it's probably going to happen between six and nine. Right. You know, it's like, I've never thought of it that way. So that's awesome. Um, Like I said, you can use it. You don't don't even have to credit me. Great. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. So there's this pressure and especially in long-term relationships that the other person is going to be the be all end all, you know, that they're going to be your safety, your security, your um, consistency, your reliability. But then over time, the human experience, humans want adventure and spontaneity and variety and risk. And in a long-term relationship, a lot of times those very adrenaline based, like excitement kind of experience are just less accessible. You have to actively or be proactive in pulling them into your relationship and your experience. And a lot of people kind of get tied up. And I, and I said this earlier, this pressure for spontaneous arousal, it's like that kind of explosion, like, Oh, you're hot for me. Whoa, I'm hot for you. We're on the landing in the stairwell of the house. And so we fuck right here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, that's not the the, like for people in especially in long-term relationships especially with kids especially like all living in the same house with uh schedules and plans and all of that it's just a lot of pressure to put on something like that that is what we see oftentimes in the movies Mm -hmm. like that's what sex is and that's what passion looks like um so just throw that out there is that you you can bring awareness to that it's, it's okay to go, okay, so this is just a portion of the sex that we are going to have. Let's not put all of our eggs in that basket. So what would it look like if we were to plan a couple of experiences? You know, I work with um, some of our friends here in Austin. I pride myself in thinking that I have this little kind of weird phrase where it's like this, if my friends have a really great sex life, then they're better friends. Like they are just available They're more connective. They're better friends as like a couple, all of that. And so I've helped a couple of them plan full on things for their partners. And that's definitely on the schedule. You know, I've helped them plan and choose which hotel room and what they were going to bring there and all of that, all planned, scheduled. And they both know, or one of them does it for the other. One of them does it for the other. They both know that that is basically what, that's what's going to happen, but they don't know the elements all of the elements necessarily. So, you know, that's something that's scheduled. Also, I'll just say Jordan and I 
later today before I have my big coaching call this afternoon for my sex and love Academy program. Um, he has queen worship on my schedule. So he found the window and he took the window. And so all week I have avoided putting, I only adjusted it by like 20 minutes because I put an interview in there, but it was a note of, I'm going to do this thing for you. And me seeing it on my calendar, on my schedule is relax, Alexa, relax. Just because it's at three or four in the afternoon doesn't mean it's not valid or worthy because it's not a work thing, you know? And so that's on my schedule. And so he has told me it's really important to him that I keep that sacred last week on Friday or Thursday, I had King worship. And basically that's just our code or our language. You can use whatever language you want, but those things are scheduled where if it's King or queen worship, it means it's all about you. I'm it's not, I'm not in it for me. If I get off in the process and that's where it leads. Awesome. But it's not about me. And so I took, we have this CBD, um, oil and I just massaged His body was feeling like really tense. He'd had a lot of emotional stuff going on recently. And so I just gave touch and love to his whole body. And then it wound up going into oral sex because I knew that was what he wanted because he told me I could just do that thing every time and it would be effective. So then, but I wound up giving his whole body touch and love and could instruct him, take breaths, do this, do that, and like really be with him. And that is an act of devotion. Like you are my person. And Today, we have one where it's going to be him doing that for me. And that's just one element. Maybe we don't even have sex after. Maybe it's complete. That's another thing that we're very present with is like, when does it, when does it feel complete? You know, like in a conversation, especially in a podcast, I know you know this, where it's like, okay, that feels like where it's going to end. And then the guest just keeps going, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, good, but like it probably would have been better if it just ended at that other point. And so it's kind of like that in, in sex where it's like, okay, this feels complete. And I really appreciate when like he helps me with that because I've also grown up knowing that the end of a sexual experience is when the penis ejaculates. And so that's something I'm continuously learning for myself is relax. It doesn't always have to be that granted. He would like for it to be that way. Like, you know, the, the job is all done around that same time, but we're both learning so even the sex coaches moving our way oh, through it, learning. That, that's a hard thing. I can. It's a hard I can, thing. I can I can empathize with Jordan because if it doesn't end that way, I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this for the next six minutes? Like, forget about twelve hours. You know what you could do? Push-ups. Really? S- squats. So, I know some people that intentionally retain semen retention. They don't ejaculate. They give the orgasm to their partner Mm -hmm. and then, or they're involved in the orgasm with their partner. And then I know one person in particular goes to the gym immediately after. I would rather just have the orgasm. (laughs) Right. However, guess what happens? Like you, as soon as you ejaculate, it's, it's refractory, um, period. And you could take a nap, give Mm -hmm. me a snack and a nap. Mm -hmm. So if you were to take that energy and instead of ejaculate, put it towards something else, like going to the gym or writing the blog or doing the thing. So there's more theory in Tantra and sex magic is semen retention, life force, energy retention. Women just have as many orgasms as you possibly can. Men Mm -hmm. every so often, maybe retain it and then go do a thing, like go direct that energy and that erection (laughs) towards your purpose or something, something like that and just see what happens. Just, you know, play around with it. I feel like I would need to come back to it later in the day. Yeah, of Maybe. course. Okay. Well, that, well, that's, later that, at night. That, yeah, that's, that's okay. That was a yeah. comforting, of course. I didn't expect <laughs> an of course like that out of you. Okay. Um, man, I could, so I mean, obviously. Scheduling you know, sex is cool. Yeah, definitely is cool. I mean, it's like cool. it's, def- especially if you have kids. Like I, I'm talking to you parents out there. Um, nap times play dates with friends, like having your parents take them. Hi mom. Hi dad. Dad doesn't listen. Mom does, but, uh, you know, hi mom. yeah. Hi mom. Um, 
you know, like all of those things, it's, it doesn't even have to be like, let's find somebody to watch the kids so that we can have sex. It could be, Hey, you know what I just realized on Tuesday, this is happening with this kid. That's happening with, we're not going to have any kids at home. Yeah. Let's make that the window. Okay. Yeah. What does that mean to the rest of our schedule? Who fucking cares? Let's just clear that space to do that. So it's definitely a, uh, it's cool. Yeah. And like sharing, sharing that, um, creating that kind of, uh, relationship with your partner where it's like, we're actively looking for these windows together and it's fun, Mm -hmm. not because we just need to do it. It's not on the to do list necessarily, but it kind of is Mm -hmm. because life is busy, especially if you have three kids under six or under seven, Yeah, under six. So Lex, I could talk to you about this stuff all day long and I, Mm -hmm. I would love to, uh, but I don't think that would be responsible. What, what I would like to acknowledge is just that I think that the work that you do with us and with your other clients that I have no experience knowing is so much more valuable than people realize that it could be. I don't think that it's the luxury, if you will. It's a luxury. But it's not, it's not far down on the luxury list. You know, it's a, it's transformative. It's not, we don't work with you because we couldn't have sex before. We don't work with you because we weren't having sex before. We wanted our sex to allow us to be greater in all ways. You know, and, and, and Mm -hmm. that's how it's starting to feel. And I believe that if people could have more confidence around sex and less questions, um, they would just be better at everything that they do. And I know as a man who likes to think of himself as um, confident, powerful, all of those things personally, there's still a level of insecurity around sex where in public you put out this, I'm fine, I'm good at it, whatever. And then in private you're like, am I though? Like, has she been with somebody better? Like what, you know, all of those things are real. Um, And to be able to put all that competition aside and just be confident that you're openly communicating about what you both like and not holding back and repressing what you really want, really powerful. Mm. So thank you for that. Everything you said. Yes, you are so welcome. (laughs) I love this. I have so enjoyed watching the two of you, you know, over the course of the last month, month and a half, just like when you show up, I could see the connection between you. I can hear in your language. I can, the, um, the joy that is accessible, even through the tiredness. And it's just so worth it doing work in this area of your life. You will never regret it. And it's this kind of stuff where it's like, you learn it, there's no turning back. This no. is added to your foundation. Mm-hmm. So, and how amazing is it? that I know your little ones are little and it's probably a very weird thing to consider that you're passing this down to them in some way. Um, it's not weird, but it's really special. Yeah, it is special. And for me, it's not weird at all. Like I, I, I understand why other people feel like it's weird, but my mom, my dad, they know I have sex. They had sex. I have a sister. She has sex. Like there, it, it might as well all be great. Why should, why should we be like, Oh, my daughters, I have three daughters. They're never going to have sex. No, they're going to fucking have sex. They might as well enjoy their sex. So yeah, you're talking to the, the wrong guy when it comes to the being weird. Like I, no. I, I might be the father who talks about the birds and the bees with his daughter, with his wife at the same time. Y'all just let me know when that time comes and I can help prepare you for the conversation. I will definitely do that. Mm-hmm. Lex, where can people find you? Uh, that sex chick on Instagram at that sex chick. That's probably the easiest. Shoot me a DM. If you enjoy this conversation, you want some resources. I'll make sure um, that at the time that this podcast goes out, some of my free resources, like the relationship board meeting or the want, will won't list. I'll put them all in the link in my bio so that all of you have easy access to that stuff. Will won't want list is powerful for those of you listening. It's just one last little thing. All of those, like you gave us the tests to take. You gave us the, you know, the, the, the BDSM test, the sexual archetype tests, they provide some value, but there's some like, ah, this is like, this isn't 
right. That you can you can look at it and say, I can see why that came up, but I don't know if I really like that. The will won't want list is my handwriting that says I will do that, I won't do that, I want to do that. As the receiver yes. and as the giver. There is no interpretation. I wrote it. And so did she. And there are things on that list that we both want to do that we never would have even talked to the other person about considering doing. So yeah, get those resources from Lex. Yep. You can find them on my Instagram. Perfect. Um, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I love uh, all of the research and the work that you put in in order to prepare for this. Yeah. So. You got it. <laughs> very, very pro of yes, you. Yes, that's right. Always pro. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Active Life Podcast. If you did, please be sure to head to wherever you listened to it and give us a quality review as well as five stars if you can spare them. If you want more from us, feel free to follow all of our social media accounts at Active Life Professional, Active Life Rx, and Dr. Sean Pastuch on Instagram. Remember, at Active Life, we believe that the healthcare clinic of the future is the gym and the healthcare provider of the future is the coach. We also believe that that future is 